presentation is about documentation and performance, which is an issue that um, all performance artists and historians, art historians, contend with. Um, primarily, when I think of documentation of performance, I think of photos, I think of video, um, sometimes I think of scores, uh, sometimes I think of performance writing. Uh, but until about two and a half years ago, I didn't think of performance art rumor. Um, and since then, I've found that rumor uh, or gossip um, had to be just as viable a form of documentation. In fact, in some ways, perhaps even a more potent and particularly strange form of documentation. And this belief has come out of my own experience, um, and it's an experience which I'm going to share with you today because uh, it's taken a very strange turn in the past few months. Um, so I am a fan of lobsters. I always have been. Um, and in the past perhaps three or four years, I've done a lot of work with animals, a lot of interspecies collaboration is a fancy word for making art with animals. And about a year and a half ago, I happened to be in Finland. Um, I know it's quite hard to scoot around the world and, and, and show strange pieces of art, but I was, I was in Finland, I was very lucky to be in Finland, and I was invited to give a performance about a chicken. And I was sitting in the cafeteria on the first day of a conference, much like this type of conference. Um, and everybody had been given passes to the cafeteria for the duration of the week. Of course, some people um, are very, I guess I would say they have less social anxiety than I do. So they manage to get together and start talking um, and socializing much quicker than I did. Uh, I uh, kind of got my strange Finnish lunch and was sitting by myself by a window and sort of awkwardly trying to figure out who these people were and what on earth I was doing here and where I was going to get the right kind of chicken in Finland to do my piece and just generally fretting. And of course, there were, just like in middle school, I was painfully conscious of the people around me and also painfully conscious of what they were saying. So much so that I think it would qualify to say that I was definitely eavesdropping with a little bit more focus than um, I should have been. And I was listening to the people at the table next to me who looked to be about the same age as me, and they were from all different countries. One was from Colombia, one was from Venezuela. And the young man who was uh, kind of hosting the conversation seemed to be the focus of what was going on uh, was from Canada. And I, I heard the word lobster which, of course, made me peek up my ears and wonder who on earth was talking about my favorite animal. And uh, I heard the young man say uh, these words, and then she said that she had to liberate the lobster from the artist, and it didn't matter what she had to do to do it, but she just had to do it. And then she liberated the lobster, and she took him to Pleasure Bay in Boston, which is a place where slave ships once came into Boston Harbor, and under a bed of beautiful stars, released the lobster. And at first she thought he was dead, but then she noticed his tiny little tail make a little flip motion as he scooted out into the water under the moon and the stars. And I heard this and I was like, what the F? Because this was my piece that he was speaking about. Um, but of course, immediately I thought, there, maybe there's somebody else out there who also does a piece with a lobster and also had this kind of strange thing happen in the middle of the, because it definitely wouldn't be me that this group of strangers are talking about in a cafeteria in Helsinki. And I was 
intrigued and wanted to hear what the responses were from the people that he was sharing the story with, but I also very much wanted to uh, interfere and say, oh my god, what are you talking about, and where did you hear this, and who are you? Um, and, of course, the who are you and where did you hear this impulse took over before I could shut my mouth and listen to the reactions. So I said, excuse me, uh, sir, are you talking about a performance with a lobster? He said, yes, I am. I, I heard this amazing story in Toronto. And I was like, Toronto? Oh my god, okay, well. I said, how, how did you, what, can you just tell me what this story is? And he shared with me the story of an evil performance artist who happened to be cooking a lobster on stage in a brutal, gruesome manner, such that another performance artist who could not contain herself was forced to liberate the lobster and free him into Pleasure Bay in Boston. And I said, well, you know, I think the funny thing is is that I think I'm the evil artist that you're talking about. And he said, <laughs> He said, well, well, who, who, how, what? And I said, this is very strange. And of course, you know, we all commented on the fact that the performance live art world is very small, and it was highly possible that this story had traveled. But first, we should go back to what actually happened, according to the evil artist. So I'm gonna uh, ask Jessica to just uh, flip us back to a video document of the piece, Consider the Lobster. So this is, uh, this document is actually about uh, 17 minutes long, and um, what happened in this piece was it was part of a, um, part of a series of work uh, called Time, Space, Objects 2, in which uh, each artist was given an hour on a clock and you actually won't be able to see it, but in the gallery, each hour, uh, there was a clock that physically had each of our names on it. And each performance was supposed to take exactly one hour. And I had been working with animals, and because I was going to be in Boston, which was a city of great significance to me in terms of uh, my relationship with my grandfather, who had recently passed away, we used to go there and eat lobster. It wasn't that complicated, but it was uh, still a very sweet memory. And uh, I wanted to do a piece, uh, it was going to be at the anniversary, the first anniversary of his death, where I tried to endow the, a lobster with the qualities of my grandfather and to give the lobster a merciful death and then to reconsume it into my body as a way of trying to connect and resolve some elements of his death. Um, particularly the fact that he had had quite a, a drawn-out um, death that, uh, you know, as many people do these days in the American health system. And so that was my intention. And as you can see here, um, there was uh, quite a bit of, uh, you'll see it occasionally in here, there was quite a bit of eye contact and I would say a deliberate way of trying to get the audience to empathize with the lobster. So a lot of the uh, gestures I was making uh, were mimicking the lobster. Um, at a certain point, uh, in fact right here, um, I would say that we were really kind of communing together. Um, the audience in question was composed of about 20 people, uh, the majority of whom I did not know, but for those of you who have any familiarity with the Boston performance art scene, being that it is quite an academic scene and is informed by a lot of the local universities and scholarly discourse, it's a very intense scene, a very um, small scene, but highly devoted. So I really felt as I was creating this piece um, and doing this right here, that unfortunately I think we're, uh, there's another version of this where it's not totally cut off, but the important parts you'll see here. Um, but as I was doing this piece, I really felt that I was like truly connected to, um, to the lobster. And it was one of the rare, I would say, rare moments in performing where I actually really allowed myself to be myself and to feel things that were um, unconscious or not really conscious of the, the viewer or the audience. Oh, um, 
Uh, we're having some lobster protest issues. Apparently, the <laughs> we can turn we can turn back to. You can just look at this part too. Anyway, I'll, Jessica, I'll, I'll just continue talking. Um, so I, I went ahead and I, um, at that, exactly at the half hour mark, I had figured that it would take 25 minutes exactly to boil the lobster um, and uh, five minutes to eat it. It was also my dinner, um, being that, of course, uh, this being performance art, there was no payment <laughs> for the piece. So I needed to economize as much as possible and had deliberately found a farmed lobster that was on sale at the market basket for $4.99. It was a farmed lobster, which is very important um, once we get to the story of the liberation, because this, of course, means that it is not uh, perhaps the best for biodiversity, and that if you um, release a farmed lobster, and let's say it does just happen to have a chance to spawn, um, you are kind of uh, mixing apples and oranges in a way that perhaps might be dangerous. But that, aside from the point, uh, at the half hour mark, I introduced into to the audience's view a um, hot pot, turn it on. I placed a, uh, the proper double boiler on top of it, uh, placed water in it, and started to boil the water, all the while with the lobster sitting there. And um, I have to also say that I am somebody who, it should be said, I believe in interfering in performance. Um, I would, I think that I would be, um, I, I myself have done some guerrilla interventions into other performers' work, and I think that it's a viable, a viable uh, response. However, um, I think that it has to be done in a particular way. I'm not saying I necessarily did it that way. But right here you can see that there's a moment of contact, of eye contact between myself and the lobster, uh, right as I'm about to place it into the pot. Watch this for a second. And at this moment something strange starts to happen. And then another strange thing starts to happen, which is that this uh, interventionist is met with another interventionist. <laughs> well, that is part of the story. <laughs> so there is this sort of, um, the important parts are, are um, underlined here. You'll see this sort of text in terms of the um, confrontation that begins to happen. and. This is another person who the plug was of the hot plate was taken out by another person, and this person comes and tries to plug it back in. At which point, it is taken out again, and I'm right now. yes. <laughs> So, so now uh, I'm in this uh, community where it seems that everybody knows each other and everybody is in on some type of, uh, it seems to be a joke in the middle of my piece. Um, and other than the fact that I was obviously hungry and annoyed, I'm also quite upset because I really had reached a point of, um, uh, an emotional height where I really did feel that I was about to consume the spirit of my grandfather. And I'm not somebody who's very uh, new agey or spiritual, but I had felt that this was a, something of a sacred, uh, a sacred event. And I wouldn't have taken the life of the lobster if I didn't feel like it had some importance. So you can see that someone in the audience says, where are you going to take the lobster? Because it's clear that this interventionist has a, um, a recyclable bag or something, and she wants to abduct it. And she says, I know exactly where I'll take it. I'll take it to Pleasure Bay. Why Pleasure Bay? It seems to have some significance to the interventionist. 
And here we have another person coming to try to continue to um, make the performance go on. At which point we have uh, part two of the confrontation where the pot is um, fully abducted <laughs> and the interventionist leaves the uh, premises and um, taking the pot, which was a, a wedding gift with her. Um, so that's, that's basically the end of it. We can, if you want to just shut that off. Um, so the reaction of the audience was actually quite amazing. They really felt like perhaps I had planned this. Um, and I think that people were actually probably relieved that they weren't going to see the lobster boiled and eaten. However, um, I was pretty pissed off, um, not only from the hunger point of view, but also from the point of view that I'd been invited to this place and it seemed like everybody knew what was going on. Well, it turned out after um, the interventionist returned with the pot, thankfully, um, that she wanted to let me know that uh, the Lobster had been released into the Pleasure Bay with exactly one minute left on my hour of performance. And that she felt she was collaborating with me and that this was a beautiful story of the lobster being liberated into the exact same geographical area where so many African Americans had been brought to their enslavement hundreds of years before. And I proceeded to have a very angry conversation with her in which I asked her if she ate lobster ever. And she said, yes, of course, I'm from Boston. And I said, well, have you ever seen lobster prepared? She said, no, in fact, that's what upset me so much. At which point it became revealed to me and I did not know that this person and her conspirator were also performance artists. And while I could see that, that it was a valid, um, that it certainly knew that it was an upsetting performance and certainly knew that um, I didn't think I was going to make any friends within PETA or any vegan circles, um, I was a little perplexed because the person who had gone right before me how was a man who um, bared his bare belly, his bare naked belly, took a straight razor, sliced his stomach, and then took a lemon and squeezed it into the wound, and then proceeded to pass out from pain. However, neither this person nor the other person had sought to help him. In fact, they had been taking photographs somewhat compulsively of this event. So I was quite confused, and I said, now, why on earth would you be able to eat lobster? But, I mean, did you never imagine how lobsters were killed or how they happened to become something delicious for you to eat at a red lobster, so to speak? And uh, I was met with the answer that I just wanted you to avoid doing the same thing that I did as a young artist. I happened to have taken a live rabbit and roasted it while it was alive, skinned it, and then eaten it. And I realize now that I've reached 50, that that was a mistake. And I didn't want you to do the same thing. So this creates a problem now, because nobody ever said that, um, well, I didn't think that this was a very uh, viable reason for having interrupted my piece. And this uh, proceeded to create a bit of um, tension between the Brooklyn performance art posse and the Boston performance art posse. So much so that when I left, there was a uh, something of a sworn, I hesitate to say gang war because a gang war is a real thing and avant-garde artists don't actually um, have real gang wars, but there was a bit of anger beyond reason between the two, two groups. And I thought that was where it was going to end, that we would just, you know, wait until this conflict faded away. Lo and behold, I find that I'm in Helsinki, and I find that this story has been told from the point of view of the lobster abductor to a 
uh, International Festival of Artists in Toronto, and it has been told from the point of view of the evil, the evil lobster-eating artist. And I was quite confused because, on the one hand, of course, as they say in show business, um, you know, any type of notice is good notice, any type of attention is good attention, even if it's bad. But of course, I felt like the point of my piece was maligned, and um, it wasn't necessarily this person's story to tell, but I also had to accept it as part of a viable form of documentation and dissemination of the work. I happened to find myself in Toronto um, a couple months later, and was asked to speak about uh, about this piece in particular, but also about having con about consuming and using um, dead animals in some of my work. And as I was speaking, a hand was raised, and they said, "Oh, you're that girl." And I said, "What do you mean you're the, I'm that girl?" They said, "You're that girl that that woman was talking about when she was here a year ago. You're the one who uh, who killed the lobster, right?" So. Now, this uh, sort of story has emerged again, and I'm try I've made my peace with it. Um, as somebody in the, uh, in the uh, audience mentioned, that um, different people have different personalities, and perhaps this is a character, this is one aspect of this person's character. But, I, and I, I righteously defended my right to eat and to kill this lobster in this piece. However, in January, I was asked to perform the piece again, and I was very hesitant to do it because I had felt that each time that I performed the piece, I got closer and closer to the lobster. And um, each time, I'm just gonna move forward, these are some images for you to ponder. Um, each time I performed the piece, I felt like I was losing a little bit more of myself and I was compromising and doing something that I really didn't want to do. But uh, the Canadian uh, art community has significantly more money than the American art community and uh, I happened to have some bills I needed to pay and I said, okay, I will do this piece and it will be the last time I do it. And I wanted to make sure that the, um, this piece was going to be done in Saskatchewan, the interior of Saskatchewan in Regina, a place where there are not many lobsters. And the person who orchestrated the piece and helped me produce it neglected to inform me, because I don't think he really knew, that a four-pound lobster would take quite a while to boil and eat. And once again, I had a very specific <coughs> amount of time in which to create the piece. And while I was making it, the um, while I was making it, the hot plate that I was using gave out. And because of that, the water that I had placed the lobster in stopped boiling. And the pot with the lobster in it started shaking and kicking. And I was trying to do my best to get the hot plate to work and to get the water boiling. I had also tried to anesthetize the lobster before I placed it in the water. But unfortunately, it kept bucking and shaking. And the audience could tell that I was quite upset. And for the first time in my life, I actually started crying uh, in the middle of a piece. And of course, I wanted to get through the piece. And I waited until I thought that the lobster was as cooked as he would be. And I removed it and began to eat it. And I found, once I started eating it, that it actually wasn't quite dead. And I didn't know what to do because I had felt that, I always felt that I needed to eat the entire lobster so as not to waste it. 
but I knew that I couldn't eat four pounds of partially alive animal. And so I asked through gesture various members of the audience to come forward and to try to help me. And I think it's a testament actually to the strength of the performance, but also the strangeness of it, that after an hour of watching this, various people did come forward and consume the raw lobster with me. Um, and after that piece, after the lobster was all gone, I became a vegetarian. Um, and the reason that I'm telling this story here today is uh, because I think that the reaction and the um, sort of outcome of the piece was a direct product of that strange form of documentation. And perhaps had I not, I certainly had, would not have performed the piece again had I not felt so attacked and felt that I had something to prove. And so uh, there is one more vegetarian in the world today. Um, but I, I wanted to share that with you because I feel that, um, you know, performance affects people in all sorts of different ways and sometimes we don't know. And sometimes we don't know the way that our work or the work of others is um, being digested in different places. So um, I, I'm ha I, I certainly am, am aware of, there, there are many different examples of scholarship, of many different examples in literature where um, rumor and oral history have become actual formal history. We can look at the Bible, we can look at the Odyssey, we can look at the Aeneid, we can look at the diaries of Samuel Pepys. Um, but this is just my own personal, um, personal experience with that. So, um, I'm sorry, I know you'll never eat lobster again, or at least for another 12 hours after I've said this, but does anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, um, I'm sorry. What's your name? Abigail, Abigail um, said that uh, since I ate the lobster while it was raw, it probably um, was in quite a bit of pain or distress prior to being consumed. And did that mirror the way that my uh, grandfather had passed away? Um, yes, I would say definitely. And in some ways, I mean, I, I, I feel like as somebody who, who performed quite a bit, um, I think in some ways I have become quite sort of callous to what I was doing um, and started to view it as, okay, well, if it's Tuesday, we're in, you know, Houston or, you know, and I think that sort of seeing the suffering that I was inflicting for the sake of an audience and for the sake of my own glorification, for lack of a better word, um, made it even more painful. But yes, I do think my grandfather died in quite a bit of pain. Way to bring it down. That's why I create, that's why I put these, uh, put these very happy dog lobster um, images. Yeah? For people who don't know, and I don't know that everybody does know, can you talk just briefly, contextualize the intervention in your performance? Sure, Maybe yeah. Sure. Um, so, uh, are, are some of you familiar with the Marina Abramovic's piece, her retrospective at the MoMA, the artist is present? Yeah, and she sat in front of, she sat in the atrium of MoMA for approximately three months, and uh, anybody who came, who, any uh, visitor who wanted to uh, could sit across from her for an um, originally a, a unspecified amount of time. Um, I, uh, I guess it was actually the 10th day of the show, um, sat across from her all day dressed like her. Um, and uh, this, I guess I would say, uh, uh, you know, was a, a significant moment in my life, um, and it sort of marked me as a, as a interventionist. Um, and I sort of got a name as somebody who screwed with other people's work. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's the context in which this idea of intervention 
uh, as it cer certainly became impossible for me to really criticize too harshly um, interrupting somebody else's work. However, I will maintain that uh, one of the, there were very specific rules to Marina's piece, including that you could not speak, um, but you could wear whatever you wanted. Um, you had to maintain eye contact at all times. You had to be awake. She had some very specific things. So I wanted to work within the piece um, to try to kind of push the boundaries of it. And I actually think that one of the interesting things about this intervention that happened was that statement on the, um, on the uh, part of the interventionist, uh, the main interventionist, who said that, um, you know, at, at 59 minutes past the hour, they had released the lobster. So that, so that there was some attempt or some kind of idea that it was a different or an alternate ending of the piece. And so there was some respect to kind of the structure or the givens. And, and, and that was something that I, I felt like I had tried to do specifically in the Marina intervention. Um, and originally the way that Marina had read that, or originally the way that the, my intervention was sort of um, perceived, I think, uh, it kind of changed over time with, the, with a shift in the dissemination of her work through her film, um, through her hanging out with Lady Gaga, through the kind of whole Marina thing that has kind of occurred. So, any other questions? Yeah. Um, I think that probably may be in time, but I, I think that actually the events of uh, the events of the things that happened and seeing how upset people were, um, and also seeing, especially once it occurred again recently, um, I think that was really the the, the catalyst. Um, and it gave me, it's, for me it was rare that something, I mean really I try not to perform too many things too many times, but it really was a completely different way of thinking about the piece and it totally has changed and kind of created a like, a, um, a crisis in terms of what, what am I going to do now, you know? Much less also like I'm, you know, in Texas and I don't want to eat barbecue, where's the tofu, you know? So there's all sorts of different types of crises. Um, anything else? Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. That was a Certainly, yeah. Uh, the question was about um, feelings about the audience and, and sort of a question about those audience members that are, I guess you would say, more internal to what's going on and that they might also be performance artists themselves or they are perhaps fans or, uh, you know, people who aren't in the scary cult of performance. Um, yes, actually, I, I, I've thought a lot about that and particularly because it was, seemed to be a very female, and I, I certainly, when we talk about Marina, there was also a sort of female one-upmanship. Uh, one um, this seemed to be a very aggressive female uh, act, and I've thought a lot about also the context within other types of interventions that were going on at the time, um, and Live Young and Georgia Sangri, uh, and Live Young and Rebecca Paytech, and Live Young and you name it, um, but, uh, a lot of the kind of the, the, the feeling among women, which I mean I can only speak to for myself, that the, uh, being, a, being a woman in art is hard. Being a woman in performance art is hard. It's a tiny little pie. And that there is a, a, a sort of a, a need or a threat. Uh, there is a threat when you see somebody doing something exciting and um, kind of perhaps having attention, that there's very little attention to be had and therefore one needs to really fight for whatever they can. And I know I'm talking over, so I'm going to say adieu. Thank you.